Thanks for tuning in to the third episode of the Oral Literature Podcast Series. Oral Literature is a public reading program held on the last Wednesday of every month at the Terrazas Branch. The podcast edition of Oral Literature focuses on the work of local writers who have recorded their poetry for this series. In this episode, we'll hear the work of John Herndon, Ed Buffalo, and Michael Gilmore, who will all be reading together on March 30th at the Terrazas Branch. Let's begin by listening to Ed Buffalo, who began writing and publishing poetry here in Austin in the late 60s. For this podcast, he shares some of his recent work. Hi, my name is Ed Buffalo. I was born in Austin, Texas in 1951, and I've lived here most of my life. This poem is entitled Plastic Rose. It's in memoriam to Dorothea Eady a girl that I knew in high school. You leaned over and kissed my cheek before closing the car door. Thanks for being my friend, you said. Only a few months later, you were dead. You wrote me a letter to say you prayed to God for release. My last letter to you came back stamped, Return to Cinder, Deceased. I strained then to comprehend the meaning of decease, just as I strain now to remember your face. Decaying memories and stray implications are all I possess at this remove. I wonder, is there anyone else who mourns your loss? I steal a plastic rose off someone else's grave so I can photograph yours marked only in my own heart. Garden, Wilderness Pale roseate light of setting sun Cool breath of wind gusting over lake water These images remain, though self be dispossessed Each datum persists in the matrix of pure perception even lacking meaningful referent. If there be no link to or from, data is locationless, a runaway lost in the wilds. He may hear breathing, see the sky, but it is not enough to make him whole. Illegible words, language unknown, littered with sherds of the Rosetta Stone. You are here. Winter Reflection Dreamlike diaphanum Suffused with flat light Slightly blue shifted Filtered through iron gray clouds Silver river flowing from past through present Into distant futures We give it a name But do not know what it is Gone to wonder in the mind No future but the moment there are occasional flares of regret if we forget to forget. Eyes closed, self as it is known, descries the inner scape, hovers above symbols and portents, wings the desolate abyss. Fantasy keeps vigil when other senses sleep. A faint stellar virtue trickles down from invisible planets. Constellation of the Butterfly Our diminished age hath but little recourse to the trove of language that is its heritage, preferring instead to send cryptic transmissions via ether. Hence, language transforms itself, and in sooth there is a low threshold. Aphoristic declension takes place as we speak. You're breaking up. Meaning was implicit in foretime. Dead men communicated with the future through books they left behind. Ashes of ashes, dust of dust, adrift in the interstellar void. Where now are the remnants of life and lust? Slow drift of particles remains, final forlorn measure of time and change. Praxis renders truth, semblances fleshed out, so to speak, in speechless orison, 
prophetic and prophylactic, empiric et phantasmagoric. Astrologian butterfly trembles on a leaf, time suspended at event horizon. Door at the end. Feeling good for a day with that particular peculiar sense of overstepping some bound I could not in any case have foreseen. Ragged mornings behind me now. Nothing's intolerable if endured long enough. I accept my place in the scheme of things, not without some sense of irony, nostalgia for naive dreams. I have been cruel out of ignorance only, or if I could see no other way. Call it graduated, but not calculated. I can and do feel shame. The poet's task to distill the essential paradox. For all departing as ourselves, paradox is manifest. Mind a corridor. Frames of Reference into the world of ideas as if the pain in my heart were so easily avoided, as if emotion could be so breezily exempted from consideration. My future dwindles, though I can't think of not being, not having this interface, not remembering, not imagining who I might be in another frame. Locked inside my mind, I sympathize with the man trapped behind the mirror, growing older by the day, unlike myself who has forever failed to grow up. Asunder, I feel the physicality of my own separateness daily, adjustments minutely improvised, wholly implicit in every breath, the specificity of fingernails overrides atmospheric malaise, mutates into imaginary histories experienced by someone else. Electricity courses the body. Wind whispers nerve ends of fire from within. Across the field, a woman's voice calls me. I respond as I have done my life long. This one's kind of dystopian, entitled Ode to Futurity. Is it poetry if it lurches and stops so abruptly? What moves us moves any beast. No plaudits for self-destructive behavior, if thine eye offend. Rummaged in the dustbin all evening. Awoke, refreshed, if slightly dazed, no agon for this dreamer in the night. Icy recollection comes only by day. Lack of stimuli leaves us staring blankly. Our tinnitus prevents us listening well. We nonetheless watch and listen, careless to anything at all. Contramundum. How else explain our role in planetary ecology? No conscience nor remorse, save for diminution of the sacred bottom line. Inherently complicit, original sin condemns us all to original guilt. No decocker necessary if we plan to pull the trigger. Retro In the continuance of time... It's the retro what catches the eye, the antique turn of speech what tickles the ear, the mechanical watch whose tick I no longer hear, fountain pen, jar of ink, mechanical typewriter, Smith & Wesson revolver, quaint diction. Time was, words lay dead on the page and mysterious, unable to convey meaning unless and until spoken aloud. Time was, selves were divided, incomplete. Thought occurred as a voice in the air, in the room, intimate, commanding, forewarning, like Socrates' demon. Time was, fallen angels instructed men in the art of alchemy. 
My name is Michael Gilmore. I'm a poet here in Austin, Texas, and I've lived here since 99, but I also lived here in the 80s. And I'm going to read a few poems from my uh, recent chat book called When You Wish Upon a Czar. The first poem is called In Taipei After Martial Law. It is dusk at the little park near Xing Long Lu, Muxing Lu Ko. Old men bring their songbirds and set the cages on benches and concrete ledges so the birds can visit one another and sing. And the old men sit, smoking long-life cigarettes. Among themselves, there is no need to speak. Next poem is called In Her Aspect and Her Grace. She was so beautiful, every time she walked by Van Gogh, glued, extra ears, to his left temporal fossa. Scorned Basho at the gardening sale. Rain, disguised as dew, hides on the undersides of leaves. Your face comes to mind, a Fuji color photograph snapped shortly before your kisses stopped falling. This poem is called The Cerulli Conclusion. Cerulli was an Italian astronomer who definitively uh, concluded that the canals on Mars were all an optical illusion. The Cerulli Conclusion. Mid-morning bus, monologuing writer to passengers at large. The Martians are subterranean. The canals we see are collapsed tunnels, highway and byways, roofs of waterways. The early engineers weren't as good as the Romans. That's why their stuff doesn't hold up. But till now, it's all the evidence we got. Now it's these robots we send, truly sniffing them out. Did you see the photograph of that belt buckle on a rock? The one That's one rodeo queen I don't want to meet. The thing is, we know they're out there now, and they knew we'd find out. That's why they've already got spies here right among us, most in fast food restaurants and convenience stores, where they get most of their intel. It's where most of us go. They don't want to bring down the government. It's the masses they're after. Bring down the masses by making them disappear. When the government's got nothing to do, it collapses under its own weight. But those calm, red-brained bastards didn't count on someone like me being so good at spotting them. I've reported over 200 to the authorities, but I can't do it alone. I can't remain invisible forever. The bus has stopped. The driver is halfway down the aisle. Sir, do you want to fight Martians, or do you want to ride the bus today? Planet Earth's prime defender... Slouches down in his seat, knuckles the buckles on his stained rucksack. I think I'd like to ride. That's good, that's good, says the driver. Then we can proceed. I'll get us where everybody wants to go. And, sir, when I get you where you need to be, I know you'll protect us all. Now let's ride. Manuscript fragment recovered from the cadaver. Words skydive off the tips of our tongues, parachuting into glasses of wine. I heard the splash that time, did you? There are fewer days ahead than before. The surprise is how stealthy this little fact announces itself. I'm John Herndon, and I'll be reading some poems from a book that was published in 2015 called Birds and Flowers. This first poem is, I attain the level of consciousness of a house plant, briefly. The breeze heaves a sigh and expires. The stillness of noon at 246, the silence intense. The disconnected clock ceases between ticks. A god in the guise of a striped cat stalks in his own steps. Others are working, playing, making love, raising kids, busy being born or busy dying. Somewhere are being and non-being, becoming and unbecoming. 
I am absent, empty, motiveless, non-existent. The tree twitches. The breeze catches a breath. The seconds resume their precise mechanical progress. Doves strike up an earth-shattering chorus of coos. This is called, I went for a walk and brought home a poem. So there I was again, prowling the waste lots. Instead of working, I was working out, i.e. wandering around the neighborhood. Along the railroad right of way, I found native grasses drying in the sun, seed heads ripe and ready for the gathering, some kind of grandma grass, side oats or blue, and purple three-on, and little blue stem. I brought a bag to carry all this home, with seeds of flowers whose names are impolite, less than politically correct, oh well, Meskin hat and engine blanket are, nevertheless, innocent and beautiful. I pray they sprout and root and bloom and seed my prairie restoration project, what some will call the weeds in my front yard. And this is the view from Congress Avenue Bridge. Lovely sky blue heron. Invisible in the hunt, perches on a ski jump, relic of the recent obnoxious festival. Granddaddy snapper, shell the size of your kitchen table, snout like an alligator, lazy, pregnant with patience, floats in sunlit green, slow growing, never ceasing, forsaking works and worry. Breathe deep. The tangy ammonia reek of the Mexican freetail bats who live in their millions beneath Congress Avenue Bridge. Every evening, all summer long, they stream forth prayer smoke, metamorphose 13 million tons of angry, irritating mosquitoes into fertile guano. That's bat shit to you, bub. An engineering design flaw created ideal conditions for the largest urban bat colony in North America. Research continues into how the error can be perpetuated. And here's a little poem called God Lives on the Ragged Edge. Rapid build-out faux quaint subdivision Cheesoid beaver board infrastructure, coy, unconvincing decorative flourishes, well mowed long grass, French drained wetland, gabioned prairie washout undermining rocks. Along the margin of the little stream, here allowed to spread out behind a series of weirs, where fish, frogs, snakes, bugs, and birds are doing their best, bulrushes, black rushes, cattails, milfoil, frustrated but persevering work to reestablish the habitat. And here's a recent poem called Stone Age, Neo and Paleo. I'll hedge this round with due scholarly caution, excluding geological formations, the vaster strata, batholiths, dikes, and seams, the age of a rock, qua rock, a single stone, a slab, a boulder, pebble, gravel, grain, is inversely proportional to size. That is, the smaller the stone, the older. In laying down these local limestone flagstones, I'm giving them distinguished company. These river cobbles lay who knows how long in ancient beds washed by running water before the dredge exposed them to the sun. The quartz is polished to a smooth matte finish. The fractures in the flint are dull and blunt. 
Please help these younger stones with good advice, or silently bear witness to the strength required to persevere so long, despite the worst the universe can throw at you. And I'm going to read a, a little series of three short poems uh, drawn from our present age of media and terror. This is called Homeland Insecurity. Homeland Insecurity. Cartoon Terror Network shut down downtown Boston. Wonder how much that cost taxpayers first responders. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Be afraid. Be very afraid. This is terror from above. 63 dead and dying birds shut down Congress Avenue, January 8, 2007. First response, full court terror squad, hazmat detox default. 50 dead and dying birds dropped on the state health department, March 5, 2007. This time with improved accuracy and less collateral damage. Boston bombed again. Engineering student celebrating graduation fastened a circuit board and battery to a sweatshirt. Arrested at gunpoint, she's lucky to be alive. And this last poem uh, was dedicated to Edward Dorn. It's called Road Rage is All the Rage. We got road raged in the Metroplex during Christmas holy days. Some guy chunked a bottle and hit our car. No body damage, but the spirit. Small wonder, you take an animal with millennia of physical and cultural selective pressure for aggression, strap on arms and armor, a 3,000 pound guided missile, put him in such an artificial setting as a limited access freeway at rush hour, and nothing could be more natural. Now throw in a couple of shots with beer back and a large bore firearm, and you've got a great recipe for civility and community. <laughs>